Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar tonight, a take on the changing trend of diversity in publishing. While our panelists and participants for this webinar are dispersed worldwide, the Thomas More Institute is located in Montreal, which is part of the Ganyanga Haga territory. We would like to acknowledge that these unceded lands have a long history and stewardship by many indigenous peoples. Jajoge or Muni Young or Montreal is historically an important meeting place for several indigenous nations. This event tonight has been organized by the Thomas More Institute. For people who are unfamiliar with us, this is an adult education institute that offers university level discussion courses in the liberal arts. The Institute's winter and spring 2023 courses are now open for registration. They can be viewed online at thomasmore.qc.ca for those who are interested. A few details about the webinar. The webinar is being recorded and will be distributed later in the week <clears throat> for anybody who is interested. Participants can enter questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and these will be answered at the end of the interview. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. Our special guest, guest tonight is Malcolm Fraser, a writer, a musical entertainer, occasional filmmaker, host of What Is This Music podcast, and editor of the Montreal Review of Books, which recently celebrated its 25th anniversary. Our panelists also include Munira Amra, who is a longtime dedicated course designer and leader here at Thomas More, and Carolyn Vandermeer, who is an author, a poet, and a member of the Thomas More community. I will now pass the baton on to our panel. Good luck, enjoy. We'll see you later. Thank you, Eileen. Good evening, everyone. We're very, <clears throat> very privileged to have you Malcolm and I'd like to start by asking you exactly what your mandate is at the Montreal Review of Books and I want particularly to know if you exclusively focus on certain types of literature because of this changing nature of the industry. Um, uh, well first of all thank you so much for having me and, uh, and it's, it's, it's really an honor to be here. Um, so to the first part of your question, uh, so the, the MRB or Montreal Review of Books is published by a nonprofit called ALAC, which is an acronym for the Association of English Language uh, Editors and Publishers of Quebec. Um, and as such, the mandate is really to cover uh, the English language publishing industry and community in Quebec. Um, so we cover uh, authors, publishers, and also illustrators and translators who are based here in Montreal or elsewhere in Quebec. Uh, we publish translations into English from, uh, you know, mostly Quebec French novels or, or nonfiction books. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the core mandate is um, English language Quebec literature. Um, sometimes publicists will write to me and say, oh, you know, this author went to McGill or, you know, they live in New York, but they grew up in Montreal. And I have to say, sorry, we, we, uh, we do have, a, we do strictly cover people who are based here. Maybe we might be known to make the occasional exception in, uh, rare circumstances, but that is, um, that, that's really the core of our mandate. Mm -hmm. And to the second part of your question, um, <clears throat> no, I mean, I think on the contrary, we try to cover as much as we can. We cover fiction, nonfiction, poetry, graphic novels, children's literature, and uh, I might be forgetting one uh, genre, but we really try to, um, to cover a wide array of books, you know, we, 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 we always say, we try to spotlight diversity in different forms, cultural diversity, but also diversity of genre. If we start to notice that, you know, we wouldn't, if we notice that we had five mystery novels or five academic books or, you know, five romance novels or something, we might 
we want to try to diversify and uh, and try to mix it up because it's really for the literary community um, in uh, in in everything that in every form that that takes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think you've answered my second question, which is who is your audience and who are your readers? You might just perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the short answer is that it's just readers, you know, people who like books. Um, of course, we want, you know, we're we're here to promote the local uh, industry and community. So in that sense, um, it has a bit of a local focus. You know, I sometimes say that we're a, a community newspaper in a funny way, um, but we are also distributed across Canada, and we have. You know, people people read the MRB all, all over the world uh, through our website. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it, it, it's it's readers, and we are, you know, we, we are. It is a small community for sure, but we're always looking to to bring people in. You know, to bring in younger writers and then the younger readers to expand into different communities who might not have heard of us. I mean, when I started my job as editor it happened to me more than once that i would say to a friend oh i'm i just got this new job editing this publication montreal review of books and people would say oh cool is that a new publication and i said no it's been around for over 20 years uh so um so when when i heard that i thought well you know i've got my work cut out for me trying to uh get us on the radar of people um because uh, you know, readers are sort of a, a a niche market these days. Sad to say, but it's still a, it's still a, a fair amount of people, and we uh, we just we want want to reach them. Yeah. Absolutely, um, it's my turn, right, Manira? Yes. Go okay. ahead. So, Malcolm, um, as this talk is about the 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 trends in publishing. Um, here in Quebec and across the nation. Uh, we wanted to, to get right into that and get some of your thoughts about that. And so my, my first question for you is, what are the emerging trends that you're seeing in, in small press publishing right now? I think there's definitely uh, uh, an eye towards reaching younger readers. And a part of that is, um, Reaching out into cultural communities, um, there's there's a lot of um, you know LGBTQ plus um, literature. There's more and more uh, indigenous literature. I'm seeing you know I, I would like to see more of that coming from from Montreal and Quebec, but certainly Canada wide, it's a uh, it's a tendency. Um, it reflects some of the broader. Um, trends in publishing, which I mean, very briefly, I would say uh, there's a, maybe more of a focus on genre because uh, genre books are, you know, popular. Um, there is in the realm of nonfiction, there's a, a trend towards memoir. Of course, that's that's not new. That's been going on for a while, but it seems to be a trend that that holds. And you even see, you know, people in their 30s publishing uh, memoir or like autobiographical work. Some, you know, which is, as my mom likes to say, that's not a criticism; it's just an observation. Um, there's uh, <laughs> there, there, some of them have really interesting stories to tell. Um, so there is a bit of a, I mean, there are still books coming out about history, you know. Uh, geopolitics things like that but the nonfiction trend skews towards uh memoir for sure um mm -hmm. that's off the top of my head i would say those are those are some of the trends that i see and and do you think that those trends are applicable to all of publishing like even the larger publishers or do you think it's a, uh do, how do you maybe a better question is how do you think the small press um, goals differ from the larger press goals? Do you see something there? I mean, that's in some ways it's almost two different beasts. I mean, I'm sure everyone in publishing 
uh, followed to some extent the recent uh, American lawsuit where the Department of Justice uh, successfully blocked a merger between two huge uh, publishing companies, uh, Penguin Random House and Simon and Schuster. Yeah. Um, and the you know the argument against it, I mean the the whole argument was taking place in the realm of these mega publishers, and uh, and the risks that they can and do take on you know million dollar uh, you know authors whose sales and advances are in the the six figures. Obviously, when you talk about small press, you're not talking about that that kind of thing um it's more niche uh and it's more uh, it's more for the it's more for the love uh than being about money i mean obviously you have to be business smart to survive when you look at the small you know even here in montreal some of our alac members have been around for, for 20 25 years or more um and so you have to be business smart to do that, but they don't, they're not in this to make lots of money. Um, I don't know if I've gotten away from the, the, the core point of your question. Is it um, it's about the trends, if the trends are the same? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, well, it's funny, you know, I mean, I am so much in this world of small publishers. I mean, we, 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 we review quite a few books from locally based authors who happen to publish with the, with the major uh, publishers. Uh, so it's not like I'm unaware of the literary uh, publishing on that side, but a lot of the work we do is with the smaller publishers. So whether they follow the same trends, I, you know, I would say yes and no. I mean, of course, you know, everyone is looking to to sell books, you know, I just said that we that they do it for the love, and that's true, but they have to keep their eye on the bottom line as well. So if uh, you know the numbers are different, but if something gets a lot of attention or sells a lot of books, well, they'll be happy about that. But they're not chasing trends in the same way. I mean, I think you could say that some of the publishers are setting trends, you know, rather than chasing after trends. The small and, and Yes, please please talk about that because that was where I was going to go next. I was going to ask you if you think that small presses are actually setting their own trends and what 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 do you think those trends are from where you sit? Because you're seeing things, you know, in such a, a, a more broad-based way as the editor of a publication. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a really good question. And I don't know if I have a the uh a really solid answer for it, but I can try to improvise one. <laughs> Um, I think that um, because some of the publishers are quite niche, they have uh, a tremendous freedom to uh, to to blend uh, genres and to, uh, to 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 make experiments. I mean, I think of there's a publisher that's actually based in in Gatineau called Renaissance Press. Mm -hmm. And they, they, their mandate uh, is really to to put out books that's that are for an audience. Uh, I mean, an LGBTQ audience, but also disabled uh, readers. And you know, when you put it that way, it sounds very uh, very niche, right? But as more as there is more and more. Um, awareness in society about these kinds of differences and about disabilities and uh you, you know the um neurodiversity and those kinds of things i think there probably is more and more curiosity and more and more of an audience and interestingly they also specialize in um you know genre books you know science fiction fantasy and and those sorts of genres that are not always uh, on the radar of literary publishing per se. So, you know, on one hand, it's extremely niche. On the other hand, it's extremely broad because um, be because these these genres can be tremendously popular. Um, 
So I think that kind of uh, divergence or overlap uh, between the, um, the the smaller communities and these uh, and these uh, big, bigger trends is is something uh, pretty interesting to to watch. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, sorry, go ahead, Munira. In your 25th anniversary interview with uh, CBC, I think Natalie Indingo, Indongo explained or told us about a story you had written when you were very young. Okay. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that? I don't, I don't remember that. What that that I that was part of the CBC interview. I don't remember. Yes, can you can yes. you can you give me a little bit more? Uh, well, apparently it was a story or a short story you had written when you were three or four years old. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, I, quite when interesting. I, when I was very little, growing up in Montreal, um, when I started to speak, um, I would t tell these strange stories, and my parents uh would write them down and then they would get me to to draw pictures uh of them and uh i i i think I, it's funny you know i don't remember telling that story to nantali and dongo but obviously you do so i guess <laughs> it was on the air um but i think she was i think i maybe told a story about uh a story i wrote it's called the worm and it's was That's when, it. yes okay so the story goes like this the worm is yellow, he lives in the desert, he painted an M, he cut down trees, he went home so he could cut down more trees. That's all, the end. I love that this story I wrote at the age of three has become my most uh, well-known uh, work. But, you know, in a way, it's been all downhill uh, ever since. I don't think Do that's think true. No. Do you think that print media is still declining or has it plateaued? I mean, I don't, I'm not a soothsayer, right? But um, I, I really like print media. I mean, I spend a lot of time online, like just about everybody else. I have found a lot of my habits have gravitated um, online. I mean, I remember in the earlier days of the internet, I thought, you know, I don't want to read long form pieces online. It hurts my eyes. Now I'm able to do that. But there's still something special about uh, about print for sure. I don't think that I will ever get tired of print. I mean, I, you know, at the end of the day, I like to turn my phone off and, you know, sit with a book or a magazine. I mean, it's physically, I think it's better for the eyes. It's better for relaxation. Um, but I mean, who knows? So, like there's, there's a niche for everything, right? And there's always um, like a kind of, not necessarily a backlash, but like a counter movement. So um, in, in the same way that, you know, vinyl LPs, you know, 10, 10, 20 years ago, it was an article of faith that those were on the way out. And people would, I mean, people still say, oh, remember record stores? Well, you know, the record stores are doing very well. Because, and the, the, there's a six month, six to 12 month backlog on vinyl records because they're so popular. Um, and that's partly because music listening has become so digitized. People want a break from that. They like a physical object. Will there be as much of a, a movement with, with books and physical um, reading? I don't know. But I think at the very least, it will always have some kind of audience. Um, but it's it's so hard to say. You know, I, I remember when uh, you know, my father was a newspaper reporter for many years. And uh, I remember him saying 20 years ago, you know, newspapers are on the way out. Uh, you know, they'll be they'll be done. You know, he said maybe not within my lifetime, but certainly within your lifetime. He said to me, and at the time I thought that's crazy. You know, you know, how can that be? But today, 
I look at newspapers and I think, I don't know, I don't see, I mean, we were talking about like a broadsheet newspaper. I don't, I, I, it's hard to see a, a long solid future in that either economically or just in the physical experience. I, 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 I like newspapers, but I mean, the, the experience of picking it up, getting the newsprint all over your hands, you have to turn the, turn to weird random pages to continue the article. I, I don't know if that's, if that is a, if that has a, a really long future, but I mean, reading in print for sure. I think, I think, so I, I yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't really say if it's plateaued or if it's going to continue to decline. I, I hope that it, it will, uh, it will always have an audience. Caroline? I think there's something, I, I mean, I'm going to deviate here from my questions, Malcolm, because you've got me going here with this idea of, of print sure. and, 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 but I think there's something about charm, right? With, with, with a printed book. Um, it, there's something maybe old world. I, I my, my, you know, to your comment about newspapers, my sister still buys the weekend newspapers and loves to go through them, you know, to get the newsprint on her hands. And I, I, I wonder if that will, maybe newspapers won't last, but I, you know, there was the age of the, um, the, digital, the digital book, right? Um, and, you know, I know some people who swear by them, but I know lots of people who tried them and they still want to go back to print, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that it can, there can be the things can coexist, right? I mean, I still the one thing I do still love about newspapers is is finding things that you're not looking for, which you know you can do that online as well, but it's different. Um, and uh, and as far as ebooks, I mean, I remember traveling. I mean, I never really was interested in ebooks, but a few years ago when I was traveling with my family, I was like, oh yeah, I don't have to bring five heavy books in a bag. I can just have them on my little tablet. But yeah. just the other night, I started rereading one of the books that I had read on that trip on an ebook and I didn't remember anything. Uh, so I thought like, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a super young person, so I might be just wired differently, but I find that like things sink in a little bit more uh, in print. Uh, digital is very ephemeral to me. Interesting. I, I had never thought about that, but that is, yeah, that is really an interesting thought. I occasionally read on an ebook as well, and I do it for the reason you do. It's when I'm traveling, I don't want to carry five heavy books because it certainly will be five, no matter where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, I have a quick technical question. Was that I'm seeing some questions pop up in this Q and A. Are we going to take those at the end, or we're going to take them at the end? Okay. Okay. No problem. Just I won't ignore look them that. for now. Okay. I'm not looking. Just, no. just be oh, patient, no. people. We'll get to them. <laughs> um, but I, I did want to take us back to to diverse voices for a moment because I think that's that's going to be a theme that sort of weaves in and out of our evening. Mm -hmm. um, and and I wanted to ask you. You know, we're talking about small presses, which I think is is probably far more relevant given the the, the <laughs> role of of the Montreal Review of Books and and ELAC. Um, do you think that um, you know, not do you think, sorry, um, for you, what do you feel that diverse, what, what are the diverse voices that small presses are capturing? Can you kind of give a sense of just like a broad base sense? I mean, I have my idea, but I'd like to hear yours. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that uh, we, we've already touched on this a bit, but obviously like the, the whole L LGBTQ uh, plus communities, for sure, uh, indigenous communities, um, black writers, um, disabled writers, neurodivergent people, um, and uh, and young people. I mean that that's you know those those those, those uh, communities that I just listed obviously intersect quite a bit, but um, but I think that the the the, the the small presses offer a, a voice for uh, new writers and, and uh, established writers too, but um, a bigger publisher might not take a chance on a new writer, a young writer. Um, when we talk about the the small presses, I mean, just being exposed to the community, 
the way I am um, through ALAC, there are some uh, some veterans. You know, they they've been around for a long time and they're doing really great work. They're also uh, sort of upstarts uh, on in the in the community who are doing really interesting stuff. I mentioned Renaissance Press earlier. There's also um, a couple of companies uh, here in Montreal. There, there's Metatron Press and Metonymy Press. They have similar names, uh, but uh, but they're different, and they they tend to skew younger in their uh, in their authors. Um, there's another newish company called AOS Publishing. They have actually, actually quite a balance of uh, established writers and 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 newer writers. But um, but yeah, I mean, I would say that's that that's a that's a kind of you know very broad overview of the kinds of uh, the kinds of voices that you'll find in the in the in the small press. And 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 before I turn um, the the spot over spotlight over to Manira, I want to ask you one more thing because I, I think we're right on that uh, topic, and I, I want to capture it. Do you think? I think you think this because it, what you said before leads to it, but it sounds to me like you're saying that small presses cater better to this um, vast array of voices that the larger presses might not take a chance on. Well, I mean, uh, I don't want to say that the uh, that the that the larger presses ignore these voices because that I don't think that would be accurate. But I mean, it comes back a little bit to what we were discussing earlier. The 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 margins and the the risk that bigger publishers take are just that much bigger that they have to, or you know, they 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 might feel they have to appeal to the widest audience possible. Um, and so uh in that sense they might not be as able or willing to take risks um on a newer writer um especially in a economic climate that is uncertain uh in a in a market that is is you know more and more niche um whereas when the stakes are lower just economically speaking there is more freedom to take to uh, to make experiments and take risks. Okay, thank you. How have your many years working for the Mirror influenced your role with the M E R? Um, well, the uh, the Mirror for those. I mean, uh, it's it's been humbling for me to know that many people don't even remember what the Mirror was, but. Uh, the, the Montreal Mirror was an alternative weekly newspaper that ran for uh, over 25 years, uh, from the 80s to uh, to 2012, and I was a uh, I was a writer and editor there in the last uh, six years or so of the publication. So, how has it influenced uh, the work I do with the MRB? Uh, I don't know. I mean, when I the, the Mirror for me was really um, instructive as a writer. Uh, I had to, I was, I, re, I was a film reviewer. I started as a film reviewer and uh, I would often have to, um, the film screenings were often on a Tuesday at 10 in the morning. And, and, and my deadline was at 2, 2 p.m. Uh, the same day. So I would finish the movie, I'd go to the office and I'd have to write the review and submit it right away in you know i would have two hours including travel time uh and that was very terrifying i can tell you at first not just at first but for a few years um but uh once you've done that for a couple of years it really gets the writer's block out of you <laughs> um and uh and I know it was just it was such a different time you know even though well it was 10 years ago this year that the mirror closed but in some ways it was it feels like a million years ago because the cultural atmosphere was so different um you know what you could get away with or what what we thought was appropriate to say was uh was different um but i mean as far as uh you know i also after a few years um as a writer i also 
became the editor of the film section. And um, again, I would say, uh, just working with writers on very tight deadlines. I mean, the, with the MRB, it's a, we're a little bit more leeway. We don't, it's not a weekly publication. So we, uh, so we're not, not, nor is it, you know, uh, I mean, I feel for the people who are in news journalism today and have, who have to put, put on, have to release stuff on either even tighter deadlines. But um, what am I trying to say? That, just that, um, we have a little bit more leeway in, in terms of the yeah. deadlines, but there's there is always still a little bit of um, pressure, and uh, I don't know. I should I, I I don't want to reveal my tricks too much, but I I was talking about this the other night with with my editorial team. Just that there there is one trick that I learned when writers would write things that are uh, that were too dense or or hard to understand. I would get them on the phone and I would say. Hey, listen, when you said this, what did you mean? And the, most of the time, the, the people would just say, well, I meant, you know, X, Y, and Z. And I'd say, okay, well, let's just use that. So I was kind of like, I wasn't rewriting their copy. I was just getting them to restate their phrase in a more conversational and easy to understand way. So, I, you know, I learned little tricks like that over time to uh to work with with writers and i also made so many mistakes and uh you know bruising people's egos or uh you know changing people's copy without consulting them um and uh and having big fights with writers or editors and uh now we're all older and wiser and we don't uh have those kinds of conflicts anymore <laughs> but um yeah you got me on a big on a bit of a nostalgic uh, trip there for a second, but I, I don't know if I answered your question. Of how yes, you did. You did it, indeed. It's different. Your interest, uh, your interest in music fascinates me. Could you talk to us a little bit about the books you promote on music with respect to the scope and the interest of your readers, of your audience? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I play music and I've written. I I never I didn't work too much as a music critic per se because I wanted to kind of stay on one side of that but uh but I did write about music uh, um I wrote a book about a, a band called Wooden Stars from yeah. Ottawa um and uh when I first started the MRB I think the first review they got me to write was a was a was a music book it was a book mm -hmm. um by an author who decided to record his own album and his his description of uh, of that experience? Um, but um, what? Sorry, what was the what was the question? How, how is it about my work? Yeah, on, and what? Yeah, what type of audience goes for this? Right, right. Well, everyone likes music, right? Or almost everyone. I, I some people say they don't like music. I'm I'm always a little suspicious of those people. But uh, I, um, I think that people have a fascination with music. They perceive it as kind of uh, magical and it, it is it is magical because there's something about it that can't be uh, quantified or pinned down or explained. But people love to know about the creative process and, uh, and what goes into it. I mean, it's part of people's fascination with just uh, explaining how things are made. You know, that I, I noticed that even years ago with uh, movies, how people would people would buy people would get the uh, the DVDs with the director's commentary, or watching the entire movie with the director talking about it and why they did certain things, and uh, and there and there's a bit of a a, a parallel there today with people, you know, people just needing to to feed the the publicity beast with just descriptions and explanations of what they of what they do. But um, I just uh, I think that uh, I think that yeah, you know, people 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 like to people love music and they they like to know more detail about it. 
There's a, there's a great book I reviewed uh, a year or two ago by Robin Sarah called Music Late and Soon. And she, she describes her, uh, her experience uh, taking piano lessons as a kid. And then much, much later in life, she returns to the same teacher for music lessons. And it's just a, just a brilliant, profound book that gets into some of the, the magic I was talking about. Uh, about music and it's it's very fascinating. Caroline? Well, I'm still stuck on some diverse voices questions and I'm not sure I wanna go there because I think we've kind of covered it. So I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about Montreal um, and, and the trends you're seeing uh, here and, and the writers, what they're interested in and, and even perhaps what you know about readers and what they're interested in here, like in the province of Quebec. Right. Well, I think that, um, you know, this ties in a, a bit uh, to, the, um, to, to the diversity question. And, you know, these things are, are delicate to, uh, to talk about. And uh, I, I would hate to say the wrong thing. And I certainly, you know, I'm like a middle-aged white guy. I don't really tick any of the diversity boxes. So I, I hesitate to, um, to speak on anyone's behalf uh certainly but um i i would all i would say that uh maybe not montreal per se but quebec i'm gonna get in trouble for saying this but we're a little bit behind certain trends i think that's part of the beauty of living in quebec and part of the frustration as well i mean <clears throat> You know, when I lived in Toronto years ago, if you, when you were on the, uh, if you rode the Metro uh, in the morning, you know, I could be the only white person on the train easily. That happened a lot. And that just didn't happen so much in, in Montreal uh, when, I moved, when I moved here. Um, now, I feel like it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's different depending on where you live. I mean, I, I live in Park X and it's very diverse. Um, and uh, to, to your question about what is about what, what's particular about here in terms of what people are, are reading or, or writing, Both. I think, yeah, yeah I, I think that that sense of being a little bit uh, behind the trends of what's happening in Canada or the world at large, uh, we're catching up to that. This kind of um, understanding that people who are not from the old stock, uh, you know, uh, English, French kind of um, divide or, or perception that th those are the two cultures, the people from outside of that paradigm or who sort of float between. Uh, are, are part of this community and live here and have voices that need to be heard. I think that is coming to the forefront in a way that maybe a city like Toronto was already there 20 years ago. I hate, you know, I don't, I don't wanna, <laughs> I'm not looking to uh, push anyone's buttons by, by suggesting that we're, you know, that, that we're backwards or something like that. Because in some ways, obviously, you know, Montreal is so unique and so, uh, you know, Quebec ha has a, is paradoxically much more progressive in some ways and much more the opposite of progressive <laughs> in, in other ways. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I don't know, I don't know if I want to wade too much into that, but. Uh, totally but understand that. Um, but I think it's, it, it's, whoops, I think we're having difficulty um i'm still hearing you but your image is frozen up a little bit yeah, okay. yeah. and am i okay now yeah, yeah. you're back. okay i think i'm just going to switch networks here um i have another network that might just give me a second sure godspeed all right okay am i better yeah oh uh, i can hear you and see you fine okay good sorry about that um but now I lost my train of thought too. <laughs> um, no, I was just curious to see if you were seeing other trends because 
uh, like you, I've lived elsewhere. I haven't, I didn't grow up in Montreal. And um, um, I think that, you know, I think there are different concerns here. And I wondered, you know, how you, how you were seeing that come through in the books that are being reviewed. So thank you for that. Oh, um, well, don't thank me yet, because I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Um, <laughs> I, um, I think that one of the strengths of Montreal is that it brings people from so many other uh, parts of Canada, parts of the world. Um, and it can, it, you know, it's part of the joy and part of the frustration of living here is that there's kind of this slow motion exodus at all times of people who just get, you know, they want something else. They might come here and enjoy the, the things that Montreal has to offer, but then they, they want something else. And sometimes you can feel a bit uh, left behind. Um, but at the same time, there, there are also always people coming here and they, they rediscover the city in, in new ways and uh and um and interpret it through their own lens i mean we just uh published a feature on um an essay collection called letters from montreal that's yes. out from vehicle press you know one of the great veteran publishers i was talking about earlier um and we kind of had quite a bit of uh editorial uh i don't want to say uh you know it, was, it wasn't strife or anything, but a lot of discussion about, you know, one of my colleagues was frustrated at a, de a depiction of Montreal in a kind of mythological way. And, uh, and, uh, and, and she said, you know, it's not a mythological city. It's a real city with real problems and, and all these things. And I sort of was like, ah, you know, I, I see what you mean, but the, the, Part of that is just baked into talking about the city. You know, certainly if you're presenting it to the outside world, the the magic or the um, the, the 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 special things about Montreal that can you know the 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 bloom comes off the rose a bit for sure over time uh, with, with all of the problems that the city has. But I like to be reminded of those magical things about. Montreal and I think that uh, they get they get reinforced and also reinterpreted with all of these with all of the the influx of uh, of people and the churn of people coming in and out of the city and I suppose that has a lot to do with you know having four major universities basically very close to the to the downtown core right two of them well three of them really in the downtown core um, Absolutely. And, yeah. 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 People don't think of Montreal as a, you know, a college town, but it, it really is. And, uh, and, and yeah, so having, having that continual influx of, of young people brings, brings freshness to the city all the time. And perhaps the mythological notion comes from that too, because they're here, they're transient in a way, you know, many of them don't stay. They come for a period of time and there's this sort of aura around the time that they're here and then they go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's 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 true. Manira? Yes, I have one last question for you, Malcolm. Okay. And coming from a brownie like me, it might seem a little bit ironic, but okay. I think I'll ask, I'll ask this all the same. If you are promoting diversity above all, are you not doing so at the expense of mainstream white Anglo writers? I don't think so. I mean, I think there's room for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't think, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's definitely, you know, delicate to, to talk about. And I, I see how sometimes uh, people from the more, um, okay, well, first of all, like the equation of mainstream with white, I, I would dispute that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it, that may have been true at one time. And, you know, I don't have stats in front of me, but I think that, you know, we are, you know, maybe more slowly than 
other countries, but we are moving into what they call like a um, minority majority mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, demo demographic situation where white people are 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 no longer the overwhelming majority. Um, and so in that sense, we couldn't really be said to be the mainstream. Um, I mean, w yeah, we, we could go in so many directions from from your question, like what does the word mainstream mean and and all of that kind of like uh, you know discussion. But no, all I meant is, are you ignoring white Anglo writers? Are they being ignored at the expense of your promoting so many different others? I don't think so. I mean, you know, if you look at our at at our pages, there's plenty of white people work being promoted, um, and uh, you know, I wouldn't say that we, we um, necessarily value diversity more than quality. I mean, I can tell you that uh, if somebody who is a person of color or part of another minority submit something that's that none of us think is any good we're not going to to promote it just for the sake of diversity that's for sure um could it happen that uh you know say we got to, say we have okay so we only have space to review so many uh books in the review that's for sure and we do want to to give uplift to the to the diverse uh communities so mm -hmm. could it happen that like a writer who's, uh, that we get in, let's say two books, one of them is by a writer who's white, one of them is by a writer who's not white. They're both equally good. Which way are we gonna choose? I mean, those those decisions we have, we struggle with all the time. Uh, Based on merit? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think so. But at the same time, you know, I've had the experience many times where I've applied for a job and I don't get the job. And I think, you know, what, you know, is it just because I'm a middle-aged white guy? I don't know. And then if I put myself in their position, I think I, I might not hire me either. <laughs> there was, a, <laughs> there was a, a 25 year old, you know, brown woman or uh, any other who was equally, you know, interesting or qualified as me. I probably hire that person too, you know. Um, but does it? But I don't. I I like to think there's room for for everybody. It's not a zero sum game where uh, you know white people lose when non white people win. I I don't I don't perceive it that way. Um, I just think like you know it's time to share. As I I have a I have a an eight year old son, so I've spent the last eight years continually saying like, don't just take everything for yourself you have to share with other people and sometimes i think that the 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 white mainstream needs to have that lesson too like there there's 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 room, there's room for everyone and uh and and it's uh and we got to learn to share caroline do you have one last question or not well i i don't think i have a question i think i have a a comment and the, and it can take us where it may but i think that that probably malcolm this what we've just been discussing just makes your job more challenging right because you you have to you have to balance you have to find the right way to balance would you think is that true uh yeah yeah i mean it it is it is a challenge but it's not but but the, it's not as um it's not as difficult as as that all the time. I mean, certainly those those things come up. It's it's definitely a concern and a it's 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 part of our of, of our mandate. But I I really don't feel like um, we're. I mean, we try we we yeah. It's a it's a balance, um, and it is. It is. Uh, it's a challenge, but it's but it's um, but it keeps things interesting. Thank you. 
Thank you Thank very much. You. Thank you so much. We will now ask Eileen to start fielding her questions from the audience. Thank you. Okay, we have some interesting questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first question we have is from an anonymous attendee. Why do you think memoirs have become more popular even among younger authors? That's a really good question. I mean, I think, I think it, it I, I wonder if you mean like popular to read or popular to, to, to write. I mean, the, 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 the simple answer about like why it's a, it's popular for writers is because uh, it's, I think people have really internalized this uh, slogan of like, write about what you know. And it's, it's, um, I don't want to say it's easier to write about your own life, especially since often these people are writing about traumatic things or deeply personal things, which are certainly not easy to write about. But the story is certainly, it's right there. You don't have to make up a story. <laughs> you just recount the story that, uh, that happened. So uh, there's, there's, there's that part. I mean, from a reader perspective, um, I sometimes feel, I, I, I'm in a phase of reading less fiction in my own personal life. And I, I don't know why, but I do think that sometimes, uh, I mean, there's so much in real life that is crazy and fascinating and disturbing and wonderful that, you know, who has time for made up stories? <laughs> that, um, I don't know if that's, if that's a, a, a sentiment felt by other people, but that's my, that's my best guess off the top of my head. Thank you. We'll go on to a question from Brian McDonough. He asks, graphic novels are flourishing in Francophone Quebec and in Europe. Are graphic novels a medium that is of interest to English speaking writers and creative artists here in Quebec? Uh, I would say so for sure. I mean, uh, we have, uh, we have, I mean, you know, again, I, I, I see things somewhat from the, from the publishing perspective. I mean, here in Montreal, we're home to Drawn and Quarterly, which is one of the most popular and, and best graphic novel publishers in the world that continuously publishes um, really, really high quality stuff year in, year out for 20 plus years. Uh, we also have some upstart graphic novel publishers like Pow Pow Press, who are actually an imprint of a francophone um, graphic novel publisher. So, I mean, they're putting out books. Um, there must be some kind of market for them. I think that, you know, as we, uh, we'll, we'll, see, um, we'll see what happens. I don't have a crystal ball, as I said before, but I, I think we may see more of that. Um, as uh, you know, for better or worse, we have more, you know, more and more generations that um, experience things more visually than, uh, than, than strictly with text. Thank you. So from Len Richmond, how has the pandemic affected publishing writers and readers? Oh, well, I mean, okay. So that's sort of three questions in a way. Uh, I think that the, impact on the publishing business has been very difficult, honestly. Um, I can say without, you know, opening up people's books uh, to the world that what the period of isolation meant, obviously, people weren't going to stores, they weren't going to conferences and conventions where a, a lot of books are sold. I mean, I can tell you, I think without saying too much that when we have our issue uh, launch events, you know, there's a table where books are sold and people buy them and they get the authors to sign them. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that, that generates sales, uh, just to put it very crudely. When we had, uh, you know, online Zoom chats, people didn't, didn't, didn't buy books, you know, anywhere near, so true. The, you know, you could provide a link where people could order it. And sometimes people would click through on it, but not to the same extent, you know, at all. Um, for writers, I mean, you know, 
I know a lot of writers and artists who would joke that their lives didn't change during the pandemic because they're such solitary, introverted mm -hmm. people who, who do much of their work alone in isolation mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, but for, and for readers, I think, I mean, I think that there was a positive side, if I can say that, to all that uh, isolation, just in terms of slowing down, focusing on what's important, focusing on, uh, on personal uh, development, if I could say that, or personal you know, things you enjoy. I mean, I certainly read more during the, the pandemic um but um you know there was the same uh the same good and bad uh qualities that there were for for all aspects of life just like on one hand spending time with loved ones or spending time with your with your family if you have a family on the other hand completely losing losing track of social life and uh or having it migrate online in this weird way. Um, so I think that it was a mix, uh, a mix of positive and negative. Do you think there'll be a lot of novels or nonfiction coming out about this issue? Have you received an influx of, of, of uh, material around this? I wouldn't say an influx, no. This, there was a there was a a book published about you know, writers talking about the pandemic, but honestly, without, you know, uh, without putting down any of the people involved in that, we were just like, oh, who wants to read about that? Like, you know, like I, I had enough. Sorry, good point. I, I mean, you know, at the same time, something like, uh, you know, Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel was, uh, mm -hmm. which was a pre-pandemic uh, book about a pandemic. And, and a sort of post-apocalyptic narrative. My wife is teaching that in a course right now. And, uh, you know, it's a great book, amazing book. The, 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 the HBO adaptation is also really strong, um, but it's, you know, it's a bit traumatic off the top for some of the students. They, I think they, they come in sort mm -hmm. of like, wait, what? You want us to read a book about what? <laughs> uh, but, um, and then also there was uh, Salima Nawaz's book that came out right after the pandemic, which was strangely uh, topical as well. So I think, you know, it's a, I mean, apocalyptic narratives will always have a certain appeal, but, but, but there's a, it's also can hit, hit a bit close to home these days. I wanted to say we've had several comments on people remembering the mirror. So I think it's gone, oh, but not forgotten. And well, I can I, attest I, to that too. I appreciate that. And I always like mm. to, to hear that because sometimes people will say, oh, you know, I miss the mirror. And I, I always find that touching because, you know, mm. at the, it, to me, if the biggest takeaway I have from it, and I, I'm still in touch with a lot of colleagues from, from the mirror and the, some lifelong friendships definitely came out of that. Um, at the you know at the same time back then a lot a lot of people just complained about how bad the how how little we were paid and like all, all kinds of things like that but we didn't know how good we had it in a way um but uh but yeah i've definitely when i speak to younger people i've i've said like oh you know i used to write for this paper called the mirror and a, a little while ago i said that and some the person said Oh, that was before I moved to Montreal. So that's that really sunk in <laughs> yeah. more than the people who confused us with yes. the hour or the people who you know were only vaguely aware of, of the mirror mm -hmm. at the time. But yeah, I mean, you know, I think that that kind of publication really served a function that uh, is yeah. uh, is is missed. But at the same time, you know, um, uh, time keeps on uh, keeps on ticking and. Uh, there's no sense in uh, dwelling in the past, but I, I appreciate that very much. Thought you would. Another question from Brian McDonough. He's asking, how has the cultural atmosphere in Montreal changed from the time when you were with the mirror? You oh. talked about that. You talked about how it, culture had changed and it's in different states, different places. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, it's, it's so much has changed in in the last in the last ten years. I mean, I would say probably the. I mean, the, the mirror sort of prided itself on like, you know, quote unquote, political incorrectness and kind of like pushing people's buttons and saying things to piss people off. And, and I don't know if that attitude would be as welcomed today. In fact, I know it would not be as welcomed today. And honestly, like sometimes in with some of the, you know, uh, culture, culture war, or, uh, you know, ideological battles of the past few years, I've confessed that I've thought, I'm glad the mirror isn't, isn't around to be embroiled in these battles, because we might have found ourselves on the wrong line, or the wrong side of, you know, certain conflicts, you know, there was a, an attitude, and some people still have this attitude that like, you know, freedom of speech is the most important thing. And like, it doesn't matter if you step on people's toes or or, or, or that it was positive to piss people off and, and offend people. That's not really a popular perspective today. And I, I, I understand why. And I can tell you that many of us have kind of come around to the to to seeing it differently than we did back then. But that's that's big. And uh, other than that, I mean, the, in, in Montreal, of course, there's like always a bit of like, or in Quebec, there's always a bit of like plus change kind of like vibe with the language conflicts. They seem to go to go down off the radar for a while and, and they come up and those frustrations. So th that's still around, but yeah, that's what comes up. Uh, that's, that's what I think of, that's what I was referring to when I talked about the cultural climate. Are you including in that some some degree of political correctness that is including in what in that commentary that you've made? Are you suggesting that political correctness plays more of a role than freedom of speech does? Well, I mean, you could. Yeah, that's one way of putting it for sure. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't like even like to use the the term political correctness today because I feel like it's kind of been co opted or like. Mm -hmm. I mean. I mean, but I guess like short answer, yes. I mean, people, you know, today, it's not considered cool to to offend people. It's uh, it's considered offensive, and there, I think that a lot of good has come of that shift in uh, the way we 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 see things. But it's also occasionally oversteps and uh, and. Uh, you know, people feel like they they can't. Some people feel like they can't say what they mean, or I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to. Like, it's difficult. It's a difficult I, concept. It's difficult to get around. Yes, Lots of is. discussion on it, but it's it's delicate. And I think that it sounds like you must have to struggle with that occasionally in the in the review. Sure. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not a major concern, but of course, you know, every once in a while we go like, hmm, we're going to get in trouble for saying this. We usually put it in anyway. We're, we're, we're not, uh, you know. Not timid. <laughs> well, no. Oh, good. no. Good to hear. Another question from Brian McDonough. We still have a few more minutes. If you're still with us, Malcolm, you're working very hard. Uh, what are the tricks that have helped you to write reviews or articles within a short deadline? You talked about that as well. No, yeah, you to... uh, I mean, Honestly, the deadline is the trick. Um, you know, you just, you sit down and you put your fingers on the keyboard and start writing stuff. And then, uh, and, and then you might think, oh, this is garbage, but the, you know, that's what editors are for. And, um, or maybe you write a draft and then re you rewrite it. Um, I don't know. I, I, I honestly, like i don't have a i don't have a magic trick for it it's just you know it's just getting over your own insecurity or your own uh, s s stumbling blocks and you just the only thing you can do is just put your fingers on the keyboard and start to write and then something will come of it that's a hopeful stance thank you for that well uh, you, know, <laughs> you know it, when when i had if i hadn't done that I wouldn't have got a second chance 
and I wanted to do it. So I had to, I had to force myself through that insecurity or that, uh, um, you know, fear of, uh, of, of not knowing what to say. We have a question from Heather Stevens. In the age of it, and in, bra in the age of, in brackets, intentional disinformation, how can you ensure maximum credibility in reviewing? Hmm, that's a really interesting question. I mean, you know, we're not putting out uh, news. So of course, we wanna make sure that the information that we put out is accurate and we do fact check and we have uh, you know, a proofreader who, who catches things sometimes. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a review, it's someone's opinion, right? We try to choose people who, who know what they're talking about and are gonna say something intelligent and, uh, but you know, it's not, when it comes to someone's opinion it's uh it, it's it's not it's not really right or wrong it's just their educated perspective but was the question about credibility yeah how do you how do you uh, ensure that you're credible and you're reviewing right well i would say it has two stages one is choosing the right reviewer and two is in the editorial process. I mean, we do spend quite a bit of time going over things and sort of going, is that tr like, does that make sense? Is that actually true? Can we say that? Or should we ask the writer to rephrase it? You know, and things slip through the cracks. I mean, we just published something that had a, had a mistake that the writer was quick to point out to us. So we corrected it online, but, um, yeah, I mean, we do our best. That's all I can say. We're we're not, you know, we don't, we're not the New Yorker with an army of fact checkers, but we do our best. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a question from Kathleen Dunn: Where or how would you recommend publishing a book of poetry that is also autobiographical? Um, well, I mean, uh, there are. Uh, there are works of poetry that are autobiographical. I mean, just last night I was at the QWF Awards Gala and David Bradford's book, uh, Dream of No One But Myself is uh, I think an autobiographical um, long poem or series of poems. And you know, poetry is, is quite personal to begin with. So um, I don't know if, as far as like where to publish, I mean, Many people self-publish these days. It's it's easier than ever to do. But if you if you would rather um, approach a publisher first, I would say like my my only main advice is to like get to know the get to know the the, the world. Like see who published something that you really like, and and uh, and see if you can approach them or see who the publishers are. I mean. You know, you can go to the, the ALAC website, AELAQ.org, and that has links to all the, of our member publishers. Go check them out, see what kind of things they do. Could it be the right thing for you or is it something totally unrelated? Narrow it down to something that uh, you think could be a good fit and then try your luck. But it's so much, you know, I, I'm not, I am not a publisher. You know, so I, I, I can't uh, I can't give you any like deep wisdom on that. But that's that's my only thing. It's so much about the network and the community, you know, get to know people, get out there, be part of the community, get 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 your voice out there and uh, and, uh, and take your chances. Thank you. We have a very uh, interesting comment from a former student. Uh, by the name of Antonio Arch. I won't read it, it's quite long. Uh, thank you for that, Antonio. He's asking about publishing within the TMI community. I would suggest you get in contact with TMI about that question. Um, moving on, there's a question from Rena Campius. Do you see encouraging vitality and growth in English publishing in Quebec at this time? Uh, I hope so. I mean, right now, it's, it's a difficult time. You know, I, I don't like to um, dwell too much on like the 
how hard it is to be an Anglo in Quebec um, because I just, you know, I, I don't like, I don't really like that. Um, I don't really like where that goes. <laughs> um, but I think we can, if we're being honest, it's a, it's a time when a lot of people are, are saying, oh, do we, do, are we welcome here? Do people like us? Do people want us here? Um, so, uh, you know, the publishing world is as much, uh, you know, subject to that as anything else. Um, but I mean, you know, we talked before about the, the, the churn or the influx of people into, into the city. And I think as long as people uh, want to come here and live here and be part of the, of the communities here, then there'll be uh, an opportunity for, the, for, uh, for publishing and literature to thrive. So we have one final question uh, and a final comment, but I'd like to read the question first and I'll read the comment. Can you, this is from Len Richmond. Can you speculate in what direction literature will go evolving from our current culture? Where do you think no. we're gonna go? <laughs> no, um, I- <laughs> Big question, big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like to make predictions because um, probably the, uh probably the, the the next generation of writers and readers are already somewhere that we don't don't know about i mean i think that probably technology it's fair to say will will be involved um because you know we now have at least two generations of what they call digital natives you know people who were born into the, the world with uh, with the internet and and smartphones and technology. And uh, so I think that, uh, that, that, that could be, you know, you know, there's a whole Japanese literary genre of like text message novels. You know, it's not one novelty book, it's a genre, you know? So like the, there could be, who knows what the future could hold. You know, back when the internet started, there were all kinds of wild experiments that now just seem kind of dated and 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 silly. So I feel like if I speculated what it might look like now, I, I it wouldn't it, it it might not have anything to do with uh, with what it will actually resemble. But I think that um, visual storytelling and technology are almost certain to be involved. And I'll just pass one comment on uh, from Rena Campius. I'll just read the last part of it. Um, sh she says, yes, a lot of good has come of the ship towards recognizing that being offensive is offensive. And that's in, in reaction to the comment he made about political correctness, et cetera. Uh, oh, so Len Richmond says, terrific reply. Malcolm, thanks when you talked about evolving. Uh, from what, what direction literature will evolve to. Malcolm, I want to thank you very much for a charming and an engaging evening. I want to thank Munira and Carolyn for uh, all the work that you've put into making it, uh, that as well. I want to thank the audience for being with us tonight. Uh, and thanks for the great questions, made my job really easy. Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to remind you that you will receive a link uh, to the recorded event. Uh, later in the week, uh, that there's still registrations uh, for TMI courses available. Uh, should you like to find out either about those courses or more about Thomas More, you can find us at thomasmore.qc.ca. Thank you again, everybody. It was a great evening. Thank you Thank all you so much. Welcome. Thank you all.